That's a pretty fun way to start the morning. Um, yeah, now if there are some strange happenings going on throughout DC over the next month or so, um, I know nothing and you are all suspects. So thank you for the inspiration. Um, let's see, Neva, next up uh, we have Dave X here. Uh, Dave X was lured to the Black Rock Desert in 1992. After several years of creating large-scale fire installations for Burning Man in 1999, he realized the time had come to either self-regulate its use or face outside regulation, and so he became the self-described most combustible manager on Playa, uh, and he now manages Black Rock City's fire art safety team. So he's here, here to do a bit of storytelling. Dave X, welcome. <laughs> Um, first of all, I want to say, I speak in front of a lot of groups, and um, this to me is like playing the Met. Like, I feel like <laughs> I'm not even really clear. And Michael, Michael, you've been a great inspiration to me over the years, and I first got involved with Burning Man when I picked up the Rough Draft newsletter in the Rainbow Grocery. And I can't believe that we've come from there to here with our exhibit at the Smithsonian and speaking here in front of what I describe as the Met. So if I'm a little bit nervous, like bear with me here, but th this is a big deal, and I think my parents are both past now, but they would be proud. This would be a moment <laughs> where they would give me a thumbs up. And Michael, I think your parents would be proud of you too, wherever they are. So thank you for all the work that we've done. So I know a powerful phrase, and that phrase is for Burning Man. It's like a magical phrase, and I don't use that term lightly. If you went to a bar and you told all your friends that you wanted to build a giant whale and it was going to have a nightclub in it and you're going to serve cocktails and it was going to shoot fire out of the top of the spout you would pretty much get dim looks from everybody and they would say well, what, I don't even know what you're talking about but if you attach the phrase for burning man to that suddenly it's a real thing right? The four Burning Man adds a touch of reality to that because people know that impossible things happen all the time at Burning Man. You've given people permission to believe in that dream of the impossible becoming possible. As a matter of fact, the more you talk about it and the more you describe any crazy thing that you had in mind, whether it's a zebra corn that shoots fire that you ride around in the city searching out the most delicious cocktails, whether it's a giant typewriter that you type out letters to no one on, or a video game where if you miss a dance step, you're completely immolated in fire <laughs> safely. It all seems possible all of a sudden because you've said it's for Burning Man and people have reference to that and it becomes a possible thing. As a matter of fact, you'll meet people who will help you with your project. They, they'll have, do hands-on labor to do it. You'll find carpenters, you'll find craftsmen, you'll find people who do fundraising on the internet and make that dream real. And you'll even find a professional welder from Alaska who does pipeline welding who will help you to weld it together safely. All these things become possible because you've uttered the magic phrase for Burning Man. Well, is it transformative though? And I hear this phrase thrown around quite a bit here. You know, the, the event is transformative. And, and I'm not saying that in like a new age way when you buy the spirulina smoothie and the lady at the counter tells you this spirulina smoothie is going to be transformative. <laughs> right? That's not what I'm referring to. I'm referring to the older, more mythological transformation. And when you look at that, well, what is a transformation? It's got tests through hardships. It's got... Uh, embracing camaraderie and meeting new people and going through the hardships with those people and it usually involves some kind of a journey. And um, well, when we look at each of those details, well, we got hardships at Burning, believe me. At Burning Man, we got hardships aplenty. Just any task is multiplied by the heat there, by the dust blowing in your, in your face and, and decreasing your lung capacity. You really struggle out there in everything that you do. And that struggle can even be on the most domestic level. Like you may cho choose to camp at one of these 24-7 dance camps and you think, wow, I love EDM. Sounds like it'd be a great thing to camp in a dance camp. 
Well, that's great for the first night and all, and maybe even the next morning you wake up still fresh. But by the third day, when you're brushing your teeth to EDM and it's rattling the fillings in your mouth, and you get up to use the, the, the porta potty and you go in the porta potty and it's resonating to the base, and you're like, God, I just want to use the bathroom. Can somebody please make this damn stuff stop? You, you can be tested even by that, by the neighbor, by, by your spouse, by anything. Anything becomes so intense out there that the trials and tribulations and tests are for sure. Like, nobody can question that we have tests of strength and and endurance at Burning Man. And is there camaraderie? Well, I would say yes. Some of the best friends I've ever met out there have been at Burning Man. And the fact that we all work together in this extreme environment, it kind of borders on the, the work that the military does, although I'll never draw that direct, direct comparison because we're not as endangered as they are every time. But the working in these hard environments and, and meeting people out there is really rewarding and, and you got to trust these people too because the work that you're doing you know somebody might be operating in a crane above you and and all this kind of stuff and, and you got to make sure that those folks are trustworthy so you really get to know and trust the people that you're working with out there there's nothing so bonding as a surreal moment on the desert as the sun is setting and and your friends and you're having a cocktail and listening to some obscure bizarre music that somebody brought from somewhere or or the crane operator, you know, that you just met, or surreal moments of music on the playa, folk music from folks dressed like bunnies, and, or even people questioning, what the heck are you talking about, man? And then you have to justify what you want to do to, to your friends and family. And so the relationships that I've built out there on the playa, I think, are super valuable and remind me of mythic quests where you meet some random groups of people and you take on these mythical, mythical tasks which seemed impossible but are not possible. And so my journey, well, there's always a journey involved in any mythic journey, in any mythic adventure. And this is me at my first Burning Man in 1992. Before this, I had been on tour with the Grateful Dead. And I, then after, uh, you know, some time with the Grateful Dead, I also did a stint as a civilian contractor. So I came to Burning Man a little bit confused <laughs> between which direction to go. And I think Burning Man offered me a great path here. And so... As Burning Man went on, I, there's a picture of the man there in 92 and me looking out of my tent. Look, there's hardly anybody there. It was a few hundred people at most. As I got involved with this, I put down the drum jam and I picked up the flamethrower. And it first started with my friend Charlie Gattigan. He created these long 300 foot long cloth paintings that blew in the wind out there. And as the wind would move through them, it undulated in the most beautiful ways. But he didn't want to bring these things back to the city because A, he would have to pay for storage space on it, and B, he would be strapped to that piece of art for the next year. He would have to bring the same thing and continually set that up. He wanted to be free of it, not only to not pay any additional storage costs, but also so that it would enable him to create new works going forward into the next year. The burning of it gave him the ability to cleanse the palette and recreate something. And that's one thing that I would just at a meeting with the National Park Service and we were talking about growth of cities. We have the great luxury of Burning Man is if we screw something up in a city, the next year we wipe it clean and we can redo that city. Unfortunately, real cities can't do that, but we have that luxury at Burning Man. In any case, he developed these long paintings and at the end of it to burn it, he would simply take a can of gas and splash it on as he walked down the length of the painting. And by the time he got to the end, he was covered in gas. <laughs> and by the other end that he started at was already drying off from the gas and it would burn very incompletely. And he said, Dave, I need a big lighter to burn this art with. And I had done a little work with survival research laboratories, so I seemed like the natural guy to ask for this. And, and in designing this, I created this flamethrower that you see here in the top right-hand corner and we could just simply, it was on a cart, push it along the length of the painting, completely immolating it as, a, as we went. And there down below is another version of that. And back then, everything at Burning Man came out of the dumpster. Every part that you see on there either was pulled out of a dumpster or a scrap yard or, or something else. Maybe there was probably $40 worth of real purchased parts in there and the $10 fire extinguisher to keep it under control. And, and I was very proud of the work that we did then. But because I was the only person doing it, at one point I became known as the flamethrower expert. When you're the only person doing what you're doing, you are by default the expert. So I was approached a little later by Jim Mason, who was also working on another version of this same type of project called the ICP. 
And Jim said, oh, I heard you're the flamethrower expert. Will you come work with me on this project? And we created these giant fire cannons that shot fire straight up for about 100 feet into the air using gasoline and diesel mixed under uh, 150 pounds of pressure from nitrogen gas. It was like a giant super soaker of fire. <laughs> so it would shoot these fire up, but it had an inherent problem, and that was that what goes up must come down, and often the fire would just rain back down on the machine and catch it on fire. But that was no obstacle to our fun. We had fire extinguishers, and if it caught on fire, we put it out, and then we started it again and fired it up some more until we ran out of fuel. And this worked great. But what we didn't know at, in our amateur days here at the Burning Man is that when you use the dry chemical fire extinguisher, that the dry chemical element would get caught in the valve, and by the next day, all the gas pressure had leaked out. So the next day, we, we'd done one of these events one Saturday, and on Sunday, we decided, let's go out and burn off the extra fuel. It would be great fun. And we fired these things off, and of course, the fire extinguishers were already partly depleted, but when one of the machines caught on fire, it rained down, caught it on fire, we went to put it out, and all the fire extinguishers were dead. We had no fire extinguishers. So now here's this pressurized vessel of liquid fuel on fire. It couldn't be a more serious situation. And back then, our fire department was something that we paid for. It was a service that we bought, that we paid for, and their job was to put fire out. They weren't there to hear any of our idiocy about burning stuff. They were, if they saw something on fire, they put it out. As a matter of fact, they tried to put out one of Charlie's paintings. The moment he lit it up, they rushed over, and they were ready to squirt it out. And it took a lot of talking to talk them out of it. In any case, they came over to respond to this, and as they pulled up in their fire trucks, I said, hey, whatever you do, don't squirt it with water. It's full of liquid fuel. It'll spread everywhere. And of course, they just threw me aside and said, out of the way, long hair, push, pushed me out of the way and squirted it with water. Well, now fire is everywhere on the playa. The playa surface is all muddy, and they fall on the ground because it's slippery, and they're just squirting the hoses in the air. It looked like the Keystone Fire Department had arrived. <laughs> Well, we finally got it out at the end of this process. We got some dry chemicals on it, and we put it out. The next day, I'm back at the camp, and I'm trying to salvage any usable parts that I can off of this device and see if we can make some use of whatever's left in the future. And up comes the Pershing County Sheriff and some local fire authority, and they're like, son, we heard there was a little incident last night. I said, well, yeah. And he goes, well, tell us what happened. And he had a clipboard, right, a piece of paper. And I'm like, oh, man, not the clipboard. And he started making notes, and he's going through it, and he's saying, okay, what's this part with that part? How much pressure is this operated under? And I thought, well, I'll be lucky if I'm not going to jail, but I'm going to be totally honest with him and tell him where we're at. At the end of it, he slapped me on the back, and he said, well, you Hollywood guys really know how to have fun. We're going to go ahead and build one of these. Keep up the good work, son. <laughs> and he drove off. And I realized that he assumed that I was some kind of expert from Hollywood and this was just an odd quirk that we'd gotten into this situation. But a light bulb went on and I realized, hey, there's a very limited window here where they're going to be fooled by this and I have to become the professional that they assume that we are and we need to create regulations to self-regulate ourselves so that we don't end up with a bad accident which will then force outside regulation in on our activities here. We need to be one jump ahead of this guy. First thing I did, I made a binder. <laughs> I got all kinds of scrap paper off of the copier. I punched holes through it. I put a schedule on the top, giant thick binder. And when they'd come up and say, what the hell are you doing here? I'd, oh, hold on. I'd get the binder and open it up. I'd say, well, look, it's 9 p.m. It's dynamite toss. It's in the binder. What? You don't have a binder? Like, I gave your boss a binder. I'm surprised he didn't make you copies. And they're like, well, if it's in the binder, all right. We'll drive off then. <laughs> so I learned something. I saw that clipboard and I learned a lesson. So anyway, I, I started progressing on my journey to become the fire safety guy. And I realized, again, if we wanted to protect all the fire that we had at Burning Man, and the first word in Burning Man is what? Burning, Burning right? I knew it was super important. We had to get ahead of it. I realized that we had to self-regulate ourselves before regulations were imposed on us, and I started on my journey. And the first thing I did was create what was called back then the Performance Safety Team, PST, and is now called the Fire Arts Safety Team. And we dragged in folks from all across industries that were relevant, special effects folks from Hollywood, pyrotechnicians, fire, uh, firefighters and personnel, 
folks who dealt with big events, LP gas professionals, liquid fuel professionals, and I formed a team of folks who are way smarter than me who could help me figure out what was going on and to help me manage this. And we also, in a very wise move, brought in other artists who had successfully displayed fireworks before. So when we went out to enforce regulations, we weren't just coming in saying dumb things off the top of our head. We really knew what we were talking about. We had advice to give. We weren't just there to tell you no. We were there to say, I think often people will say something and the first thought in my head is like, are you kidding me? <laughs> but what comes out of my mouth is that's insufficient. And I try to rephrase it so that I offer them a way forward. And these folks could do that because the provenance that they had as experienced artists at Burning Man. And so the wisdom that the fire art safety team gave out wasn't just blind regulations from a regulatory authority. It was advice and regulations. All at the same time, it was a carrot and a stick. I also then, at the same time, it just seemed like it would go together. Will Rogers here, who's going to talk a little later, uh, asked me if I wanted to help out with the fueling at Burning Man. So I started forming the Black Rock City Fuel Team. And an interesting story on how my experience with fuel all began. Uh, you know, we used to go into the little town of Gerlach to get some propane for the different fire art. Apparently, somebody had showed up at the propane distributorship pantless and with what he claimed was a flamethrower, seeing if he could get some propane for his flamethrower. Well, first of all, pantless doesn't fly in Gerlach. Let me just tell you. And when he showed up pantless on the lawn, I'm sure it was all the propane guy could do to not release the dogs on this guy. But in any case, he called us and said, look, I, I can't sell you guys any propane. And how can I believe it's ever being used responsible? This is my li livelihood, my license. I don't want to be sued for giving you guys propane. You got to take some kind of action. And so I would get up every morning, round up the propane tanks for the art, and I would go into town and I would tell them I was there to pick up their propane because we were cooking a hell of hot dogs and hamburgers. I'm cooking hot dogs and hamburgers all night long. And that gave him the liability to be able to sell us that because in his mind we were only cooking hot dogs and hamburgers. That protected him for a while. But eventually we started to use so much propane out there that, that we, I just couldn't do it. I was getting up at sunrise and I wouldn't get back till sunset and then I was distributing propane. My whole experience was living in Gerlach, filling propane tanks. And frankly, I think it was starting to affect my thinking. All that propane gas vapor <laughs> didn't feel so good by the end of the day. And I thought, we got to get a truck, our own propane truck, so we can just deliver the fuel. But he said, before you get the truck, you're going to have to go to the LP gas board and uh, satisfy them and get licensing that you need to operate that kind of truck. And I said, okay. And I went into town and uh, I met this guy, Eric Smith. He's on the lower photo there on the right hand side. And I went and took the propane course to get the certification. And all the folks in the class were like people who ran mines and they had propane for the mines or at a gas station filling up little cylinders. And every time I would ask a question that was Burning Man related, the whole class would turn back and be like, what? What are you talking about? What kind of question is that? And I could tell that this guy, Eric, was like, I'm not sure who this guy is, but. In any case, I passed the course and I invited him out and I said, Eric, will you come out and help me to make sure that we use the propane safely at Burning Man and come unofficially for one year, you make some notes, you tell me what you see and I'll make sure that we implement that as quickly as I possibly can. So he comes out in his state car and again, he's got the clipboard, but I got a binder. <laughs> and so I took him around, we looked at the art, he was impressed by my binder and I was impressed by his clipboard and we really kind of bonded. <laughs> And I thought, how am I going to win this guy over? So in a moment of genius, I drove him over to the Flaming Lotus Girls camp where they've been making <laughs> propane. And I introduced him and I said, hey, Eric, this is the uh, Flaming Lotus Girls. Now, if you can imagine if you're the head of the LP gas board for the state of Nevada, and again, you go into a bar and say, I'm the head of the LP gas board. It's that resounding silence. Like, so what? <laughs> but... If you go to the Flaming Lotus Girls camp and you say that same thing, suddenly you're a rock star and they're, tell us about the propane fittings, Mr. Propane Man. <laughs> and I, I, I go, Eric, I gotta get lunch. I'll come back for you in a little while. And I drove off and when I came back, it was like apocalypse now. He had his shirt off, his tattoos are showing, he's in a lawn chair and all the Flaming Lotus Girls are gathered in front of him as an audience as he's proclaiming propane truths to all the ladies there. <laughs> I knew we had him. I said, we got him. And so he's been working with us for years. And now we've gone from hand pumping fuel out of barrels 
and bringing that fuel into town to owning a fleet of fuel delivery trucks, liquid fuel delivery trucks, a fleet of propane trucks, and we do all our own fueling there in Black Rock City, which I'm super proud of. And again, that gave me a little more provenance and a couple more certificates, and then I decided that I needed to understand pyrotechnics, and luckily through some burner connections I made, I was invited into Pyre Spectaculars in uh, Northern California, and they're the largest fam out here on the East Coast. You have the Grucci Fireworks family out on the West Coast. We have the Sousa Fireworks family, and I was lucky to study under the best. I got uh, licensing in both Nevada and in California, so I'm ser licensed in both states. I do big displays for the Giants, for the Oakland A's, for the... Golden Gate Bridge, 75th anniversary. I have my own uh, 4th of July show, which is the Marin County Fair, five days of Marin County Fair. I travel up to Eureka doing fireworks for those guys for New Year's and, and Benbow and all different places. And I learned all about fireworks and firework safety and setting safe perimeters and understanding the dynamics of the different fireworks. So I got that licensing as well. And then I also discovered that in running these large berms, we would need to understand what was called incident command systems, which is working with a whole bunch of teams at once, whether it's our Black Rock Rangers, our fire department, our different Sandmen contingencies, the artists themselves, the, you know, the folks who are doing the ignition, the pyrotechnicians, all these folks needed to be managed in a large group in a, from an incident command center. So just like folks in the federal government do, we learned how to communicate using these IC systems and to draw up uh, risk assessment plans and then have plans in place for those risks. So again, more knowledge, more learning here. And um, I really enjoy the relationships that we have working together with the different agencies. This Burning Man was actually a really great Burning Man and one of the highlights for me is one of our agency partners is the BLM. And you know, we had a bad accident last year and this year I went into the man burn kind of nervous thinking, you know, what, what's going to happen? Don't let anything bad happen. My head was hanging down. I was pacing around looking squirrely. And this guy from the BLM law enforcement came up to me. And he goes, Dave, you look nervous. Are you nervous? And I said, well, I am a little bit. I'm a little nervous. And he goes, well, you can't be nervous. You're going to infect everyone here. You're going to infect the fire department and the rangers. And, you know, you're the center of the wheel here. You need. And he said, Dave X get your shit together, man. And he gave me a poke, like my drill sergeant. And I was like, well, yes, of course I will. And I pulled out my timeline and he really snapped me too in that moment. And he helped me get through this year's burn. And I really thank our agency partner. So Bernie Man has been very good about developing these great relationships with the different agencies that we work at, work with. And I'm very proud of those relationships. It's not adversarial. We really work good together. In any case, I also had to master the spreadsheet. <laughs> I, you know, when I first came to work, I started working with Crimson Rose here, and I could barely spell my own name, truthfully. And Rosie would bring documents back to the to my office and put them on my deck with the school teacher circle and the arrow and spelling and all that. And and then I'd never even heard of a spreadsheet, you know. And I started working with those, but now I can bang out Word documents and spreadsheets in my sleep. And there's been many permits which I've pulled simply because I outwrote or outspreadsheeted the, the documenting authorities. When they respond with a 20-page response why we can't do something, I'm immediately back with a 40-page response on why we can do that thing, 80-page response why we can't, 120-page why we can, and then finally they're, I don't even got time to read this, go ahead and do it, I'll check on you later. <laughs> So I've learned that documentation, careful organization, spreadsheets are the key to this. Without spreadsheets, we would have nothing. Does everybody agree? Yeah. I can't even imagine the horrors if some hackers released a spreadsheet-eating virus into our world. We would show up on the playa with a board full of post-it notes, and the first win that came by and the event would pretty much be canceled. So thank God for the spreadsheet. All right. So... Put all of that together, 20 years later now, I've supervised some of the biggest burns ever attempted for the purposes of entertainment. I think I've burned hundreds of wooden art structures and participated in the planning for and safe, safe execution of thousands of LP gas flame effects, going on close to 100 fireworks displays. I have, at this point, become the burning man. And... <laughs> And 
I, for, I, every day in my work life at my desk, I see the impossible being made possible. It's an incredible desk job where people say the most preposterous things and a little voice is saying that'll never happen, but my bigger voice is saying, are you kidding? It's for Burning Man, it's definitely gonna happen. <laughs> so one day I get an email, right? I'm going through my emails and I see something and it's from the NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association. And I'm like, uh-oh. Am I in trouble? And that's the organization that regulates the use of fire, regulates fire extinguishers, building life safety. They write all the fire codes. And I thought, oh man, I've come up on their radar. And I open up their email, and actually, they want me to come speak at their conference <laughs> in Las Vegas. So I presented a presentation there with a number of other people on life and fire safety for large festivals. And I couldn't believe how I've gone from the guy with the book, with the schedule and the printer paper, just punched holes through it, to actually the guy who was helping to write these codes and participate with the NFPA in working on life safety for large festivals. So have I been transformed? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I would say definitely yes. And do I think it could transform others? Yeah. Hell yeah! <laughs> Even the BLM, you know? <laughs> this guy was clearly having a Burning Man moment out there, you know? I can almost hear the rave music playing in his head as he's out here dancing. <laughs> in the wilderness here so how much time do we have left any little bit of time well i'll tell you guys one more fire safety story and you know on if, put your hands up if you've ever been to burning man so that's most of you here we have a free bike program where we supply free bikes to participants that they could ride around and it's called the yellow bike program act and actually they're green just because that's how we roll at burning man <laughs> nothing's apparent but the folks who work on those bikes are pretty tough characters. They're like the hell's angels of bikes, but with punk rock music playing in their head. And, you know, they got little vests and little patches that say what club they're from and pretty tough characters. And this guy came up to me one day and he goes, I heard oh, you're the guy I got to talk to. And I go, well, what do you got in mind? And he goes, well, I want to light my bike on fire, light myself on fire, ride over a ramp that's on fire into some fire. What do you think? <laughs> I said, well, I'm not sure there's a survivable part of there. Like, and he said, well, if I ride fast enough, the fire won't get in my lungs. And I'm like, oh, I don't know about that. I go, I'll tell you what, let's start small. I'm going to give you this little firework, and we can tape it on your bike helmet here, and you could try riding over the ramp with the firework on your helmet, and we'll work up to completely on fire from there. And he looked so disappointed and so downtrodden. He was like, oh, man, you're really like, was that it? I go, well, yeah, yeah, let's try that first. And so the night comes, and of course, he's ready to go. He's probably had 20 shots of whiskey or something, but we're still going to go there anyway. And he puts the thing on. We light the firework. He starts to ride over the ramp, and he immediately crashes and lands on the firework and burns his arm a little bit with the firework. And I'm like, man, I shouldn't have probably even given him the firework. But he came up to me, and after that, he said, dude, you're the smartest guy I know. You saved my life. <laughs> And then I knew not only had I actually probably saved his life, but I also had his respect then. And he went on to be a big voice of reason when we were doing stuff, you know. He would say, you better check with Dave X or, you know, like all. <laughs> he was right there with me and he respected me. Now, if I'd come in and be like, absolutely not. That's the stupidest idea I've ever heard of. That is forbidden. The first thing he would have done is got drunk with his friends and gone out and done it and, you know, just show me what was up. And it would have been a whole different story to you. The key to this process of working with folks at Burning Man is to offer a path forward, to look for the right path that not only does the safety requirements and the due diligence that we need to keep going as an event, but also gives the artists a way forward to look for solutions rather than the impediments, to spell out the impediments, but try to find the solution with the artists for that, not to just be a rubber stamp no guy and offer no explanation. Often when I'm doing firework shows, I'll get some fire marshal to say something completely absurd. And when you say, why is that? He goes, I don't have to explain myself. I'm the fire authority. Bang his fists and you know, nobody respects that. You've all dealt with inspectors and, and building people and stuff where you're like, I don't know where that came from, but they never offer any explanation or a way forward. 
What we do is offer a way forward. We want to make the impossible possible at Burning Man, and it happens every day from my desk or on Playa. So I thank you guys for, for hearing me out today. And let's all keep the burning and Burning Man. Thank you.